Hey guys, so today I want to get into heat effects. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is uh, in a system or with a body, how does heat transfer? So there are three different ways. Uh, there's sensible heat, latent heat, and chemical reactions. Uh, today I'm not going to be doing chemical reactions, that's for later on in the course. Um, we're just going to start off with sensible and latent heat. Um, and I'm going to show you the equations that go with these. So for sensible, we're going to go through heat capacity and all everything you're going to need for heat capacity. Uh, then we're going to look at latent heat. So the Clapeyron, the Clausius Clapeyron, uh, the Riddell and the Watson equation. And then, yeah, then we should be good to go. So to start, uh, I'm going to be talking about sensible heat. So just really quickly up on top, I'm going to write a little a little what this means. So it's when heat is exchanged by a system or a body uh, and the temperature changes. So heat, so change in temp, change in temp when heat is exchanged. So you're gonna see <coughs> two, um, you're gonna see something called heat capacity when we're talking about this. So uh, the heat capacity is the amount of heat we have to add to a body or a system, whatever you wanna call it, to raise the temperature by one degree. So you're going to have heat capacity, which is denoted by these CV and CPs over here, uh, at constant volume, so that's the V subscript, and constant pressure, which is the P subscript. Uh, and then on the left of that, you're going to see uh, those differentials, uh, and those are just the definitions of the heat cap capacity. So there's no, there's no reason to really overthink it. Um, those are just the definitions of these what these heat capacities are. Um, so if you're given an equation for internal energy, uh, you're going to integrate it with respect to temperature, and you're going to treat volume as a constant. That's all. And that will give you uh, the heat capacity for a certain substance. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, in this class, you're going to be seeing different models for heat capacities. And those are, models are going to be based on the tables that you're given. So the tables that you will be given um, are here. So for example, if you look uh, up here for heat capacity, uh, heat capacities of uh, gases in ideal gas state, your heat capacity correlation is going to be the following. I'll write it here. So you'll be given heat capacity correlations will be given to you. And those are just gonna be in your tables. So for example, the one for the one for ideal gas. I'll write that ideal gas, for example. Uh, this is the equation you're gonna work with. Heat capacity at constant pressure over R is equal to A plus B T plus ct squared plus dt negative 2, <coughs> where what I'm underlining in green are all constants that you're going to be given in your tables. And um, also, don't forget this r down here. Uh, that's also a constant, so the green makes sense there. But you're going to have to multiply it uh, by your right-hand side in order to get your heat capacity. Um, Something which is going to be useful, and it's easy to forget because it's so easy, is that uh, your heat capacity at constant pressure is equal to your heat capacity at constant volume plus R. And this is the last one I have for you. Uh, it's an important if you have an ideal gas. So ideal gas, again, don't forget your ideal gases, um, is if you want the heat capacity of a mixture of ideal ideal gases, mix ideal gas, that is equal to Y2, CP2, plus, etc. So the Y1 is your mole fraction, 
and I'll write that here, mole fraction, and the CP1 is the heat capacity of your first species. So, for example, if I have methane and ethane, and I want to know the heat capacity of that mixture, well, I would get my CP1 from the equation up here that I just showed you guys. This one up here, equation number three. Uh, and then I would do the same thing for my CP2 of <coughs> ethane. Did I say methane first or ethane? Whatever, the second, the second species that I need. And then uh, depending on what my mole fractions are, I would just multiply those by the heat capacities and I would have the heat capacity of the mixture. So yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, regarding your tables, you can see that the heat capacity correlations for solids and for liquids are different. And depending on the textbook, these are going to change. Um, just one thing to notice, uh, just so it's, it's not, it's not complicated, but just so you don't mess it up that, um, for example, if I'm looking at methane, the first one up here, um, the constant, so I have A is 1.702. Your B is going to be 9.081 times 10 to the negative 3. I understand here it says positive 3. That's because it's 10 to the 3 times B. But we just want B alone. So B alone is 9.081 times 10 to the negative 3. And same thing for your C. So it would look something like, I won't write out the whole thing, but CP ideal gas over R. Right, let's just bring it over right away, is equal to A, so 1.702 plus 9.081 times 10 to the negative 3T, and then our C, I'll just, I guess I'll just write it at this point, uh, plus negative 2.164 times 10 to the negative 6, to the negative 6, T squared. And then you'd plug in your temperature in Kelvin, uh, and you can get your, your heat capacity at constant pressure of your ideal gas. So yeah, <laughs> pretty straightforward, nothing really to overthink. The next thing I want to get into is latent heat. Uh, so that's when we have phase changes. So uh, I'll write that here, phase changes. So that's, for example, if I have a glass of ice and water, and I'm trying to melt my ice. Well, it's saying that while my ice is melting, the temperature will not change until all the ice is melted. So, um, yeah, it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you're gonna see four equations uh, in this course for that are connected to latent heat, and the first two are the Clapeyron and the Clausius Clapeyron equations. Something I want you to note is that this one is for ideal gas. And if you're like, what the heck are these equations? When am I going to use them? Uh, these are just useful for if you're looking at a graph. Um, looking for a graph and you're going to use the graph to tell you uh, the heat of vaporization of some substance. So, for example, if I look at the Clapeyron equation, I want to do the Clausius Clapeyron. It's a, it looks a bit more complicated. So... That will be better. Um, if I have a graph here, I'm going to plot ln of PSAT, my saturation pressure, versus 1 over temperature. Let's say I have this line. Um, this slope, so let's say slope is equal to 5, is going to be the left side of my equation. So I would say 5 is equal to negative change in enthalpy of vaporization over R. And R is just a constant, so I can find my change in enthalpy of vaporization. So really not too complicated. These two equations just have to do with graphs. So same thing for Clapeyron, except your y-axis would be uh, P sat and your x-axis would be temperature. And then here we have our change in volume of the phase change. So change in enthalpy, uh, not a vaporization of the phase change. Uh, well, yeah, I guess you could say vaporization, um, depending how picky you are with your words there. But yeah, so the phase change, uh, 
vapor uh, enthalpy is what you're going to get. And this is really useful just for graphs, looking at the slope and it giving you information. And then lastly, uh, oops, I made a little mistake, read down equation. Um, <coughs> these two are also pretty straightforward. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it pretty quickly. I'm just going to go through what um, symbols uh, I'm talking about in these equations. So I'll start with the Riedel equation. Uh, it will tell us the normal enthalpy of vaporization. So that is this little delta Hn, which is the heat of vaporization. Heat of vaporization at 1 atm or 101.3 kpn. Uh, then we have r, that's a constant. So r t normal t reduced normal and p critical constants. So, uh, where am I going to find these? Well, you're going to find these in your tables. So, for example, if I'm looking at methane, my T normal is here. It's 111.4. Um, what else did we need? We needed our uh, P critical, our critical pressure. So, that's right here. We just have to look at our table. Oh, and it's already in bars for us, so we're not going to have to change that. This is going to be in bars. I forgot to mention that bar. Um, and then our T reduced normal. Uh, I didn't talk about reduced temperature yet in any of my videos, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. The equation is as follows for T reduced. It's equal to T over T critical. But in our case, that's going to be T normal over T critical. So <coughs> T normal, what we said first, that's from the tables. P critical, we showed you that. And then T critical is right here. So you're just going to divide your T normal and your T critical. For methane, that would be 111.4 divided by, oops, I circled it, 190.6. So pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, really not that hard. Uh, and then lastly, our Watson equation is uh, when you have two temperatures and you want to know the heat of uh, a phase change. So, for example, if I'm given the latent heat of vaporization for some substance, uh, or I want to know it for uh, the heat of vaporization um, at some temperature, so at like 300 Kelvin, well, I would just do, I would say, I'll write this, delta H2 equals what? And we say, okay, well, we want to know it at 500 Kelvin, let's say. So that would be, we know T reduced is T over T critical, 500. So T critical, well, it depends what species I'm talking about. Let's say I'm talking about methane. So our T critical is uh, 190. Remember, make sure these are in Kelvins. That's, that's important. And then uh, I would say, okay, well, I know my enthalpy <coughs> uh, 1 and my T reduced 1. And let's say you're not given that. Well, you can get your... You can get something. You can get delta H1 for methane from your tables because you can get the delta H normal, which you will find right here on this table. So if we're doing methane, let's say, well, I'm going to have to look here. Methane, methane, methane. Where are you? And you are not here. So that 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 works, I guess that works. We will go with methanol. Um, 
no, don't do this, guys. This is this is not how it's supposed to go. Um, but yeah, you would get your enthalpy, your normal enthalpy, uh, for your latent heat of vaporization at the normal boiling point. Uh, so let's say that is for methanol, uh, thirty-five point two one, right there. Well, it's 35.21. Here, let me just change my T reduced and put that for methanol. So we are going to look for methanol. Methanol, methanol. Here you are. 337.5. Uh, what am I doing? I need that too, but 512.6 for our T critical. Five twelve point six. Delta H1. And then our T reduced one. Well, we're going to look for the normal temperature because we got the normal latent heat of vaporization. So for methanol, it's 337.2, 337.2 Kelvin, and our T critical is 512.6. So these two go together. These are at the normal boiling point. And then, yeah, then we can look for our change in enthalpy of vaporization at 500 Kelvin which is that. So you really, you would basically need one temperature in order to find your uh, enthalpy of vaporization because your other data can, you can get from your tables that you're going to be given. So pretty straightforward. Sorry about that. I didn't know I was going to be missing stuff <coughs> or unless I, I just can't see it right now. Um,